Hey everybody, Stu Smith here, going live, taking some questions and giving some answers. Also going uh, to show some videos on the combat swimmer stroke where we can just critique them. And uh, if you have questions along this process, please just post them up there in the, uh, in the comment section. I will get them, whether this is on Facebook or YouTube. Um, I am uh, recording to both right now, live. So you just post a question and I will be able to see it. As we gather a few people on, and before you start to um, ask questions, I uh, wrote a couple of really good articles this week. You got to check them out at stewsmithfitness.com. Um, first of all, I wrote um, uh, one... Late last week, early this week, I didn't go live last week because I did a podcast. Um, you guys got to check that out. That was with a uh, Coast Guard rescue swimmer. I was on their podcast, The Rescue Swimmer Mindset. We did a fun show there. Uh, probably going to have those guys back on and talk about their journey going into the Coast Guard rescue swimmer program. Uh, but one I wrote, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see one called uh, are you a master at skipping workouts and learn how to turn that around? So it's a little motivational piece more than anything, but it also really kind of digs deep into why are you skipping workouts? You know, because it's all about habits. You know, we get good at what we do, but we also get good at what we don't do. So if you're not working out on a regular schedule, you will get good at that meaning you will continue to not work out on a regular schedule. So you just have to change your habits in order to make that work out for you better. It's a fun little read. You should check it out. Um, there's some really good testimonials in there as well that can really boost. Um, like I said, motivation is one thing. Um, eventually, that motivation has to turn to discipline. And that discipline is from creating new habits, getting rid of old habits. It requires discipline. After that, there's this sort of grit and mental toughness that is produced. And then after that, it kind of goes deeper into your psyche a little bit of like, how bad do you really want this? Do you have a particular goal that's set out in front of you? Are you striving to do um and then there's that final moment of like when everything's falling apart and you're not doing very well, you're not seeing gains or you're going through a hard selection program and you ask yourself, why am I doing this to myself? You better have a really good answer at that point, because that's the big question mark at the top of the pyramid. If you remember me talking about that one, but if you scroll down the articles, you will see all of that uh, conversation that I've had over the uh, past few weeks on just getting after it um, and staying after it because that, that's it's pretty important. Um, another one I wrote on, it's a long journey, had this guy lose 40 pounds in uh, a year, but he also got in bud shape at that same time, but he was real patient with the process. It's a really good story, really good uh, testimonial of his journey. Um, and we just kind of walked him through that. And then I finally did one, uh, just yesterday posted this one and it's about becoming an FBI agent and believe it or not, my best selling programs on stewsmithfitness.com are FBI workouts, uh, army ranger SF, uh, pipeline workouts, um, a calisthenics cardio workout. That was a real big one, especially when COVID came up and gyms were closing, but people still like to do a lot of calisthenics and cardio with minimal equipment. And then the other one is, believe it or not, the Air Force Special Warfare uh, program. It's just a really good program for those seeking any of the jobs in Air Force Special Warfare, PJ, CCT, TACP, um, you know, special reconnaissance, you know, those type of things. Um, and because there's some new fitness tests that they need to prepare for, and I just updated it. So if you're looking at Air Force, that's a good one. 
uh, both Army and Air Force are giving out bonuses for recruiting into those jobs. Uh, the Navy is not, unless it's Navy EOD. They definitely are because they need Navy EOD guys. Uh, but BUDS and SEAL Pipeline, they are actually overmanned at this time, and they don't need people. But they will still recruit. It's just a lot more competitive. So you better have your stuff together. Otherwise, you may not get a billet in order to go to BUDS. And then getting through BUDS is actually pretty tough right now, too, with some of the highest attrition rates they've had in years. I think the last class went through Hell Week recently. They started with 190, and they finished Hell Week with 12 or 13. In about four weeks, they went from 190 to 13. So you better have your A game on on that one. So, all right, let's take some questions, and then I'll show some videos. Let's see what we got here. We got a few questions already here. Um, do you think indoor and outdoor pools should be closed during the winter? Huh? No, I do not. Outdoor pools depends. I mean, if the air is cold enough to where the water is solid, it is frozen. That makes no sense to be swimming in, can't swim in ice. So um, as long as there's a liquid, I think they should be open. Um, definitely in, in more warmer climates. Like in Florida, where I grew up, pools were open year round. Outdoor pools were open year round. Um, that's just the way it was. You swam. It was a little chilly in the morning, but it wasn't that bad. Here in Maryland, the outdoor pools close, but the indoor pools are open. So I'm not sure why you needed my opinion on that, but you know, find a pool. Um, your CSS info helped me get down below nine minutes. Nice, good job. Yeah, it's tough on the 500 meter too. You know, that's an extra length in the pool. You know, there's a difference between 500 yards and 500 meters that people don't really realize. But it's, it's significant because 500 meters is equal, no, 450 meters is equal to 500 yards. 500, let's see, if you're trying to swim, um, if, you're, if you're swimming a 500 meters in a yard pool, you have to swim 550 yards. All right, so it's an extra lap or less a lap, depending on which one to go. Meters obviously bigger than a yard. So good job. That that's a fast meter time, 500 meter time for sure. Um, how many slow runs per week build a good aerobic base? Uh, trying to balance low heart rate runs versus fast runs. Well, here's the thing: once you've built a good aerobic base, there's no need to do long, slow distance runs anymore in my opinion now for most of my guys who are training with me are focused on a mile and a half four mile timed runs or five mile timed runs or much longer rucks so yes an aerobic base is needed and if you're beginning to run i would recommend probably even mixing in 50 percent of your cardio being running Mixing in some rucking in there if you need to ruck, but also non-impact cardio like biking, elliptical, rowing. So you can get the aerobic base without all the extra miles because beginner runners hurt themselves every year trying to put on a lot of distance, even if it's long, slow distance. That's where they're going to just bang themselves up, get shin splints, knee tendonitis, foot pain, you know, all of those things. Um so once you've built that aerobic base, I don't think it's necessary. And you need to run with a purpose. That's why I have a, a running program. It's up free. In fact, I'll post it right here. Um, running to get you to and through selection. And all this is, is 20 miles a week of running. But it is um, done either at a six or seven minute mile pace. There's no slow distance at eight or nine minute mile pace because i tell you why we had a few guys over a few years ago leave due to covid and they just started running on their own they built up to like 50 miles a week but they were doing majority of their runs at like nine and ten minute mile pace which is 
way too slow. It's ridiculously slow. Um, so when they got to Bud's, they could not run four miles at an eight minute mile pace, even though they were running 40 to 50 miles a week. So run with a purpose, meaning if you're trying to get a 28 minute four mile timed run, that's a seven minute mile, you need to be running your runs at a seven minute mile. Now, if you can run five or six miles at seven minutes, good, but there's no need to run five or six miles at nine or 10 minutes, unless you're building an aerobic base, right? But you still need to balance that with, you know, you're, you being a beginner runner building an aerobic base and also you um, focusing in on too much mileage as a beginner runner. So there's, I always recommend, you know, the good thing about most of these jobs that people are really trying to get good at doing is there's a good amount of running, but there's also a good amount of swimming. Uh, one way I built an aerobic base back when I was a younger guy and trying to turn myself into an endurance guy versus a strength and power guy is I basically did triathlon training. I ran, swam, and biked. So two thirds of my cardio were non-impact cardio activities that helped me build an aerobic base without just running. So does that make sense? So my answer to you is if when you're in an aerobic base building phase, like I said, half to two thirds of your cardio can be non-impact cardio every day. But, you know, if you're wanting to run and do that, I would say one to two, maybe. Two, let's get it at two. I'd say two aerobic base workouts, two goal pace mileage workouts. That means if you're trying to shoot for a six minute mile on a mile and a half or two mile timed run, or a seven minute mile on a four or five mile timed run, then um, you, you set your goal pace to that goal pace of six or seven minute miles. And then maybe throw in a you know, above goal pace type run with some intervals, sprints, intervals, and things like that, hills, stuff like that. So that would be my suggestion. If you guys check out that article, Nicholas, you'll see the way I break it up a little bit, running with a little more with a purpose. All right. Sorry for that long answer, but I like that question because um, a lot of people screw that up, especially when they're beginning to run and then they just run too much and then they can't run at all. So, um, how many rest days, mobility days do you take in a week? Um, I do one mobility day in the middle of the week and my Sunday is an easy day. It might be some other activity versus working out. It may be a mobility day. It may be a complete day off where I don't do much of anything. It just depends. You know, if I got a lot of yard work to do, I'm going to be busting my home five, six hours doing yard work, if um, moving furniture or whatever, you know, it's just catching up with the chores around the house. Um, but some days that's, I'm kind of still sore from Saturday. So I'll do some mobility work. Sometimes I'll go hit the pool or go for a long walk. But those are my two easy days. I do have five really hard days during the week. And that's usually a split routine, uh, upper body, lower body combinations. So hope that answers your question. How does someone get into dev group? First, you need to go be in the Navy. Um, and I guess they do have some non-Navy personnel in there, but you can get to dev group from many jobs. You won the majority of people who are at dev group are SEALs and have screened to go into dev group during the first three to five years of their career. Um, then there are EOD guys that go, there are CCTs that go, um, there are, um, you know, Intel guys. I mean, they have all types of guys, weapons guys, they have all types of jobs at Dev Group. And um, so, how does someone get there? They need to apply, just like any other job because you'll be stationed there. 
I am currently on week eight of the Ranger SF program. Your tips on sit-ups change mine. Oh, nice. 59 to 80. So just to let you know, tips on sit-ups, you know, a lot of people don't like sit-ups. And I get it. I don't like sit-ups either. But if you're getting tested in sit-ups, you need to practice sit-ups. Some. Doesn't have to be all. I mean, there's many ways to work your core system by just not doing sit-ups and, you know, hip exercises. Um, but, you know, sit-ups, you know, requires a pace, just like running does. Remember me talking about goal pace running a minute ago, about a six-minute mile or a seven-minute mile? Sit-ups are the same thing. Where people screw up sit-ups is they start off way too fast in the first 30 seconds, and they might get 40 in the first 30, 35 seconds, but they can't get 40 in the next minute and a half. So what's that tell you? You start off too fast and you burn yourself out. So if you slow it down, slow down a nice steady pace, usually about 20 or 25 every 30 seconds, it's a lot easier to maintain that pace. And next thing you know, you go from burning out at 65 to pacing yourself into 80 and 90. You know, and the next day, I mean, this has nothing to do with strength or endurance or anything. It's just a strategy to uh, pace yourself a little longer, you know, so you're not wasting a lot of energy um, in those first 30 seconds. So it's it's a simple tip on sit ups is pace yourself just like you do in running. So Air Force giving 50K. Yes, that's right. For a six-year contract and only 40K for SEER and EOD. Only 40K. Sounds like that's only 40K. That's pretty good. You know, it you know, it shows they need people, you know, and you know, the army's doing something similar to that as well. Uh so you know, Navy is not, except for Navy EOD once again. I think Navy EODs is 30 or 40. I can't exactly remember what it is, but it's significant. Okay, is it dangerous to swim in the deep end of a pool if you're not fit enough? No, you can be unfit and swim, but as long as you are able to swim and you have the technique of swimming, it's not dangerous. But if you suck at swimming, I wouldn't go near the deep end, personally. Okay, man, some of these questions. Um, is a nine-minute, 500-yard swim good enough if I'm fast with fins? Yes. Absolutely. 99% of your swims at Bud's will be with scuba fins, and if you can nail a two-mile swim in 65, 70 minutes, open water, you're solid. 13 guys graduated 351. Yep. I got rolled in 350, was in Hell Week support. Hey, Stu, for ocean swims, did you ever find it beneficial to just keep your lead arm extended the entire time? No, I did not. I typically use that bottom arm just to breathe. So it stays extended up there, and so is the top arm. But when I need to breathe, I get that bottom arm, top arm, bottom arm and roll it in there. But you don't need to do a lot. It's not a full arm stroke. Think of it more like a breaststroke skull. So it, it is literally, it is literally like this. You know, it's not a full arm pull with your hand goes all the way down to your hips. Um, yeah, so breaststroke skull, S-C-U-L-L. -L. Look it up and you'll see what I'm talking about. So top arm looks like freestyle. Bottom arm looks like a breaststroke skull. On that note, why don't I share a video of some guys swimming and we can discuss it. All right. So we'll go into a share screen. Go in here, watch some video. All right, here we go. So we just kicked off the wall. All right. So here's what we're looking for when they kick off the wall. Good streamlined body position. This right here so far is not very streamlined body position. You want this elbow locked in on your side of your head, touching your ears. Your bicep should be on your ears or even behind them. All right. So kick off the wall. Not bad. Could be a little more streamlined. That double arm pull, not that great either. So if you look what the double arm pull looked like, that looks like a jumping jack. 
So he is only using his shoulders to do that. And he's broaching the surface. So all of that momentum was just lost transitioning into the CSS from the breaststroke pullout because he broached on the surface and that double arm pull was not that good. Just kind of transitioned into a, uh, you know, let, let me just recreate the whole thing. So see that broach right there and just stops. So you, you don't want to do that. So top arm, bottom arm, kick and glide. He's got the timing down. So on this side, it looks like, looks like he's got a pretty good scissor kick. So that's not bad. A little bit of extra flutter kicks not needed. A little bit better streamline could be used. Let's see how this looks. And depending on which ways he's facing, he's either doing a strong side or a weak side. It's like he's still, let me see, which way was he facing last? Okay, so he's facing away from me going down that way. He's also facing away going back. So that means I bet this side is his weak side. Yeah, you can tell his kick's a little wonky. So what happens with this, if you notice, Notice this kick. Oops, sorry. Notice this kick. It turns instead of a scissor kick, like it starts off like a scissor kick. Right here, starts off as a scissor kick, but look at it. It's turning into a breaststroke kick mid-kick. So you lose a lot of power on that, on that kick. You either want to do a breaststroke kick or you want to do a scissor kick. You don't want to mix the two together because that produces almost no glide. Watch, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. And he's not even, he's, he's having to pull before he's actually done. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, pull. Yeah, so he's, he's shortening his glide because his kick's not getting him anywhere. Definitely on his weak side. I thought his strong side looked pretty good. Let's see how it looks. See if which side he goes back on this side. Top arm, bottom arm. Kick and glide. Yeah, I wish you would have been facing me the whole time versus facing away from me the whole time because then I could see if your arms are really close to your body. It looks like they may not be, so a tight recovery is needed for a little bit better streamlined position. But that's not bad. Your strong side's pretty good. If you if you go back on your weak side here, yeah, you got to work on that breaststroke pullout. It, it shouldn't look like a jumping jack arm pull it should look more like a almost like a muscle up in the water grabbing water with both arms and pushing it behind you versus this multi-directional jumping jack pull you do have a high elbow return on this weak side which you might get called out for might not overall not bad you just got to work on that weak side a little bit so pretty good pretty good all right let's take some more questions how would you adapt training for 60 days from PSTing so as? Um, I would make sure most of my workouts looked like a PST. If I'm taking a PST and it matters, what I mean by that is it is a competitive situation where your score on this PST is going to make or break a decision of whether or not you get to go to special um, or what is it? <laughs> so has is a uh, seal officer assessment and selection. So your PST matters. So make sure you are really focused on the PST, right? That means running your mile and a half fast, no long, slow distance stuff, just fast mile and a half intervals. Um, you can run your 400s, 800s, but run them fast, you know, depending on your goal. Do a few practice PSTs, you know, throughout the, the month. Definitely in those 60 days, you should probably take a PST three or four times just to build up the capacity to get through the PST without, you know, being exhausted and then still being able to run just like you are able to run fresh. So there's some things that you can learn in that process, such as, um, you know, type of nutrition that you need to be eating before, you know, figure out, you know, what you need to eat the night before, what you need to eat the morning of, um, how do you snack 
threw out, you know, what juice or water or combination carbohydrate mix is good for you during a PST. Because the last thing you want to do is take a PST and try something new that day. You know, I've seen people just throw up in the middle of push-ups because they were chugging some kind of goo down that they'd never done before. And they heard, ah, this might help. Yeah, don't do that. Test it out long before you you play it. So you're testing out nutrition. You're testing out your ability to handle the whole PST. You're working on those little things, a strategy where you can push really hard and pull back a little bit, depending on your strengths and weaknesses. All of those things matter. So if your PS, if your workouts for the next sixty days don't look like a PST, you're you're not. Um, you're not really focused on the PST, in my opinion. Yeah, you can do some auxiliary exercises. Absolutely. You can run more than a mile and a half. Absolutely. You can swim more than 500. Absolutely. Um, but overall, you should do a split routine with mostly calisthenic-based programming, in my opinion. Split meaning upper body, lower body split. I've been doing a lot of pull-ups recently. Problem is I had a bad posture during the exercise. As a result, I developed some shoulder pain. Any tips on how to continue? Um, you know what? I really don't. You know, give yourself some rest. Um, sometimes that happens. Sometimes I'll get a shooting pain in my shoulder or go up to my neck when I do pull-ups. You know, it's like a pinched nerve or something, almost like you slept funny uh, overnight. And that just eventually goes away. You know, some massage may help it, um, but I wouldn't overdo it too much. You know, stretch it out, massage it, give it time to heal, right? Um, see, I'm getting in the pool two hours a day, first hour swimming, half and half with fins, half without. Uh, what type of water con drill should... I do the last hour. Depends. What are you training for here, Midge? I'm assuming Air Force, since you knew the uh, Air Force bonuses. Um, I would practice everything that you're going to be doing in the pool. You, know, you should be practicing um, underwaters, but never alone. You should be practicing... Uh, treading water. You should be practicing uh, buddy breathing with a snorkel. Um, you know, swim PT. So mix in some push ups and abs and flutter kicks, charged mask, um, flutter kicks. That's always a classic. You know, get on the pool deck with a mask full of uh, water and do flutter kicks. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff you could do. You know, there's, there's uh, programs that can help you with that. Uh, tips for learning weak side of CSS without fins. Um, I would suggest this. First, learn the strong side of CSS without fins before you try practicing the weak side. Your strong side should be good to go before you even play around with the weak side. Otherwise, you know, it's really hard to mirror image what you're doing right if you're not doing anything right on the strong side. So you want to master the strong side, mirror image it on the weak side, get some videos of you and you can see yourself what you're doing differently from both strokes and readjust, adjust each time. But I would suggest, you know, once you've mastered the strong side, you feel pretty good on your strong side, go and start making 50% of your swims on your weak side. That means changing, just like that last video we saw, he was changing strong weak every length. So he'd go down on the strong side, come back on the weak side. That's a great way to practice, I think. That way you're kind of always going back and forth um, and you're reestablishing the good habits of the strong side into the maybe some of the bad habits of the weak side. Right. So you're always practicing it, doing it right on one way. And then you have to kind of switch the brain and pretend you're throwing left handed if you're a right handed guy and start reestablishing 
you know, some of those movements on the other side. Hope that makes sense, but that's how I do it. With and without fins. I don't double arm pull off the wall when I do my CSS, just kick off the wall, streamline into my stroke. That's fine. You don't have to double arm pull off the wall. Just be good and streamline and don't waste any energy. Don't uh, broach the surface, um, lose all your momentum, things like that. How to cope with cramps during swimming. I've had that happen. It was really painful. Yes, it is very painful. Um, just relax. You know, mostly cramps occur in the calves because your feet are too flexed one way or another. You're either flexing them or you're pointing them too much, and that will cause a calf cramp. Or you just need more water and electrolytes, and you're cramping. Either one is will cause you to not be able to move your legs very well, so you'll have to rely on your arms to get you to the pool's edge. That is what I would recommend. Just swim with your arms. There's plenty of swim workouts that you can practice just not using your legs and just using your arms so you can feel more comfortable using just your arms. There's nothing wrong with breaststroking over to it without kicking or you can freestyle arm pull, uh, get yourself to the edge, but just relax. That's the biggest thing. Just relax. It's a cramp. It's not going to pull you under and make you drown. You still got your arms you can use. Hey, Stu, have you found that rucking has any correlation with regular running faster or longer distance? Good question. You know, I have not put the two together as such. I will say this. When I have an option, like when we do our Spec Ops triathlons, it's a, it's a run, ruck, and swim event. I always choose to ruck first. Get that ruck over with. And then I run right afterwards. And I will tell you this. It always feels better to take off that ruck and you feel 50 pounds lighter when you're running. So, yes, in that instance, I'm definitely a better runner because I feel like I'm a better runner. Does that make sense? Um, but, yeah, you know, um, you know, I, I can see that it helps with running, but I'm, I don't know the... I guess, statistics or scores on how much better rucking can help your running. You know, if you're just walking with weight, it's probably not going to help your running. Probably won't hurt it, uh, but probably won't help it. Um, but if you're moving out pretty fast and got a pretty good shuffle, maybe like a 10-minute mile pace with a ruck on, um, that could definitely help your running, I would think. It's definitely going to make running feel, feel easier if that's if that's any help with that answer. I've been doing a mix of yours and just run friends over a year and a half and can't break six minute mile. Five, six, 175. Food and sleep are good. Is it possible I hit a plateau? It is possible. My suggestion is try to focus on that six minute mile event by doing six minute mile goal pace intervals, right? No sprints, no long, slow distance, just focus on a few weeks of doing three minute, half miles, minute and a half quarter miles for, you know, half a dozen to a dozen sets. So you build up to about three mile workouts of those intervals resting less and less as you progress i would say maybe try to start off at a 50 percent rest to your work ratio meaning if it takes you a minute and a half to run a 400 at a six minute mile pace which is, that's the goal um you should rest 45 seconds if it takes you three minutes to run a half mile at a six minute mile pace is the goal you can rest a minute and a half. So try that and then slowly try to see if you can uh, reduce that rest period to, you know, half of what that is. So that's what I would do. See, if you're kind of stuck on a plateau, just practice for a week goal pace running and see what happens, you know, and give yourself two or three weeks of it. I think you might, uh, you might like it. And if you need to, um, 
maybe just run every other day, but bike and swim really hard on the days in between. See if you just need some recovery from running as well. All right. Um, let's see. Go on SR. Gotcha. Um, 200. Is 200 four count flutter kicks in one set a good foundation for buds for that particular exercise? That's plenty. You know, be honest with you, I don't think I ever did more than 100 four count flutter kicks. But here was the grand finale of some workouts. Now, I'm not sure they do this anymore, but for us, it was your pants were wet, your boots were on. That makes a big, that's a game changer with flutter kicks. Try your four count flutter kicks with wet pants and a pair of boots on. Um, first of all, the other one, what we, we would do, we do a hundred four count flutter kicks. We do a hundred leg levers, just up and down a hundred times, do a hundred scissors or morning darlings, you know, just open, close, open, close six inches off the ground. Never put your feet on the ground for those hundred, hundred, hundred. And that was a really good one, two, three combo for working the hips and core, you know, abs a little bit, but a lot of hip work, right? So give that a good standard uh, versus doing 204 count flutter kicks. Cause to be honest with you, I don't think they do 204 count flutter kicks anymore. You may on a weird day do that. Um, for some reason, my buds class, the instructors in my buds class had a fetish with 1000. So we did, a, you name it, we did a thousand reps of it. We did a thousand push ups. We did a thousand eight count bodybuilders. We did a thousand flutter kicks. We did a thousand sit ups. Did a thousand jumping jacks, four count jumping jacks, which means 2,000 jumping jacks. Let me tell you, that one sucked. I mean, our calves were on fire for the next two days on that one. But yeah, I don't think they do that anymore. But, um, you know, I, I can find out some of the, you know, grinder PT events that are going on out there, but nobody's really talking about them as being like really butt kicking anymore. Most of it's under the logs, under the boats, running, rucking in sand, fireman carry up a dune, you know, sand dune. That's a hard one. You know, you're going to see more of that type of stuff than four count flutter kicks, but never a bad idea to be good at them. So, cause that's going to help you with your thinning just about more than anything outside of the water. So that's why we do them is just get our hips strong enough to be able to handle the big scuba fins in the ocean. So I'm about to finish strength program from Jeff and doing his uh, PNS program. Should I treat myself like a beginner once I finish? I was running about 20, 25 miles a week before. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's necessary. You know, it depends if it's been several weeks or months that you've run. I probably wouldn't jump back into where you were, but jumping back into 50% of where you were and giving yourself three, four weeks before you build back up to that kind of level, I think is wise. Um, but yeah, if you, if you've gone more than a couple of months without double digit running mileage, I wouldn't jump back up to 25 miles a week, you know, out of nowhere. Give yourself a few weeks. Uh, if I get better at pull-ups, should I do them daily or rely on the program split if I really struggle with them? Great question, because I've seen people burn themselves out doing daily pull-ups. So you may not want to do daily pull-ups and give yourself a chance to recover every other day. And do them, but yes, if you're going to add something, maybe add them on the days that you do pull ups, or you can add a different version of them. Maybe add heavy pull downs for fewer reps or weighted pull ups in another workout session. You know, for maybe 25% of the reps that you got in the morning, maybe do, you know, do 25% of that in the evening with weight on it or heavy pull downs or rows. Maybe you need to work your bicep curls a little bit. Go heavy bicep curls too. So you can mix in some pulling on your upper body days, but I wouldn't do them on the days in between just because I've seen people burn themselves out if they do that too much 
especially if they're at a plateau already. So consider that. Now, I do have a two-week protocol. In fact, I'll put it in here. That is actually daily pull-ups and push-ups for 10 days straight. Um, this works pretty well. Uh, I've seen a lot of people increase 25, 50%. I've seen some people increase 100% in as little as two weeks. But it requires 10 days of training, three days of no training on pull or push, and then you test on day 14. So think of it as like an overload principle. Crush it for 10 days, take three days off, test on day 14. But there's an article I just posted in the uh, comment section. You can kind of check that out and uh, and try it out. But I wouldn't try it if you're already burned out. And it's not really good if you're at like 18 and 20 and you're trying to get 25 or 30. Too much volume. But if you're stuck in the single digits or low teens, it works really good for getting that, you know, distance in between 10 and 20 busted out in you know, I'm talking pull-ups, busted out in, uh, you know, in, in less than two weeks, which is really good progress on that. Then you go back to a normal split routine where you're doing pull-ups or push-ups every other day, not daily. Okay, a couple more questions. Let's see. Uh, when following a PT routine and it says repeat two to three times at the end of the listed exercises, does that mean complete cycle of two to three? Or three to four always confused me um yeah it's the whole circuit so whatever that is whatever's directly under that um applies to that repeat so let's say it's pull-ups push-ups and squats okay three exercises you're going to do them in a circuit pull-ups push-up squats pull-ups push-up squats pull-ups push-up squats that's repeat three times does that make sense? Three sets of a circuit is what we're really talking about. And it's up to you. If you want to do it two, just do it twice. Right. So I'm giving you uh, kind of some leniency there on depending on your abilities, how hard you want to push that day, you know, somewhere between two or, you know, if you want to do two or you want to do three, you want to do three or you want to do four. Um, it's kind of up to you and how you're feeling. Let's see, how long do you think someone should at least bicycle for a workout in order to progress? I'm assuming you mean progress with running or progress with bicycling. Not sure what you're asking there, but I'm going to assume running since I think we kind of discussed this a little before. Um, put it this way, however long it takes you to run, let's say I have a chart on there where at the end of the day, that column is a day of running and calisthenics mixed in or whatever. And if you do the math, it's about five miles of running total between warm ups, intervals, and a cool down. Let's say you only want to do two and a half of those because that's too much for you today or in, on your progression because it's not a personalized training program. You have to somewhat personalize it for your abilities. Um, so what I would do is however long it takes you to run two and a half miles, that's how long you're going to bike that day. So that's how I would set it up if I'm replacing running with biking. Um, but I like to do all my bike workouts for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I like to do increasing resistance every minute on the minute. I like to do one minute fast, one minute slow intervals. I like to do Tabata intervals where it's 20 second sprint, 10 second easy. You do that for 20 or 30 minutes. That's really hard. In fact, the protocol is usually set up at five to seven minutes of that. And you maybe take a couple minutes breather before you do it again. But you make 30 minutes of that. That's a really good one. All right. Hey, when you're at Buds, did it add fuel to your? fire when others quit no it didn't um you know i saw you know broken dreams when people quit you know I, and you know i did ask myself i'm like why are people quitting i hadn't even gotten hard yet you, you know so 
you know, now during hell week's a different story. I get it. That was hard for everybody, but there were moments in first phase where people were just quitting all around you. And you're like, what happened? Why are people quitting? So, you know, you didn't really know them that well at that point, most of them. Um, so, you know, to be honest with you, you're kind of just worried about you and your own boat crew at that point that you almost didn't notice people quitting. Like at the end of the day, you had to do a head count of how many people were still in your class because you just, you didn't know. And you had to track them down because there were always head counts. You had to know where the people were, were they at medical or did they quit or, um, you know, some other issue that came up. So, but no, I never, never did find that to be something that pet me up. It didn't bring me down, but it, it was more of a neutral event for me though. So that was just me though. Um, how is it rare for SEAL officer applicants to get an age waiver if they're cutting it close, applying at 28? Um, you could get one. I mean, it, it's not exactly rare. Um, I've seen a couple of, put it this way, this last year, there were a couple of 30-year-olds that were at SOAS. So they obviously got cleared through the vetting process to at least be invited to go to SOAS. So there you go. Now, whether or not they made it through SOAS and got selected, I don't know. Um, but they were OCS candidates that were uh, invited to go to SOAS that needed an age waiver at some point or very close to the age waiver. What do you make of the math method or 80-20 running as long as you're prioritizing speed work? How much of an added benefit do long, slow runs contribute to your overall running ability? Um, I think there's a place for long, slow distance running. I just don't do it anymore um, because I have a pretty solid running base or cardio base from swimming, from biking from running that I tend to now focus on. Uh, I don't need to build my running base. Does that make sense? My base is always kind of at 15 miles a week, no matter what phase I'm in of my training, I'm always going to run 15 miles a week. Now in my summer phase where I try to boost that up to 25 or 30 miles a week, that is when I may hit a few long, slow distance runs just to get the mileage in. But it really has nothing to do with my, you know, running ability these days. And if you're in decent shape, you know, it's I would suggest doing fewer and fewer longer, slow running distance days. Um, unless you just like to run and get out there and just burn some stress off. There's nothing wrong with that. Some days I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to run for the next hour because I'm kind of burned out and don't feel like thinking about a whole lot. I'm just going to run. So there are days when that is very useful, but as far as applying it to whether or not I'm going to run faster that week, I don't see it being helpful. Um, you know, for me, long, slow distance gets you good at running slowly. So if you have a timed run in your future, sometimes you need to focus more on your goal pace or faster than your goal pace than you need to do on longer, slower running. So it just kind of depends on where you are, you know, in your life right now. You know, are you training for a selection? Are you training for PT tests? Are you training to meet a standard? If that's the case, you need to build up your running and your cardio base with running sometimes long, slow distance, sometimes other cardio activities. Uh, but then you also need to build up your speed in order to hit that goal pace once again. But we we kind of discussed that, that at the beginning again. I can go off on, on that one for a while because we're constantly in that discussion year round, you know, with, with my group here in Maryland. What's a good way to start weightlifting if you've never really did much of any lifting before? Um, well, you've never done anything resistance training wise. So I'm going to assume maybe you've done some calisthenics because 
here's what I do with people who've never lifted before is I make sure they have a good calisthenics base first. So we do calisthenics, squats, push-ups, lunges, pull-ups, dips, you know, all the big calisthenic exercises that you can think of, get a good calisthenic base on them. And then we start introducing them to weights um, slowly. We'll start introducing TRX into it. We'll introduce sandbags. We'll introduce dumbbells. And then we gradually get into barbell lifting. But that can take a year, year and a half, maybe. Like with a teenager who's never lifted before, you know, I would get a good calisthenics base on a year, maybe, maybe more, uh, and start introducing dumbbells, you know, ways to make calisthenics harder, like weight vests. The TRX can definitely help with that. And then start adding dumbbells and barbells over time. But that's the way I do it. And, um, you know, maybe not start off directly with uh, free weight barbells, maybe start off with machines and then going into um, going into more free weights once you feel like you've built a decent foundation of that. Any tips, exercise on glute activation? Um, always notice that I'm considerably slower when I actively try and stand tall while running as opposed to hinging forward. Um, yeah, I, I like to kind of lean forward a little bit with my running for sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I do. There's some exercises I call swimmers where you lay on your belly and do little flutter kicks. Um, you can do, uh, dirty dogs, which looks like you're a dog, lift your legs sideways and you're like peeing on something. It's a good mid glute, um, medium medius glute exercise um you know any of those floor exercises um donkey kicks um you know I, I would mix in some of those and they're just basically calisthenics based exercises i mean i also like kettlebell movements uh kettlebell um you know goblet squats lunges are a good one we do a lot of lunges when we run in fact, most of our leg workouts will always incorporate a quarter mile lunge workout somewhere in the workout, whether it's later in the workout or it's at the beginning of the workout or it's spread throughout in 100 yard increments. Lunging is a great way to mix that in there, too. Um, so give that a shot. Jake often advises training combatives on top of your workout cycle just to develop confidence mental toughness and grit what are your thoughts um yeah i don't have any problem with that i used to wrestle i used to box um i think those are great activities um some people are getting into jujitsu ju now here's the problem with it though potential for injury and i tell this to everybody when they're four to six months away from shipping or going to their selection or whatever, pull back on activities that can injure you. That means the combatives. That means if you're a triathlete, ride stationary bikes versus road bikes, because what's going to happen? You're going to get hit by a car. I've seen it happen year after year after year. I've seen guys get surgeries in their hands for boxing. I've seen blown out wrists and elbows and ankles from jujitsu. Um, what's another one? Hips from running too damn much. Um, yeah. So be smart, you know, four to six months out, pull back on activities that can hurt you. Like for instance, I was uh, four to six months out from going to buds and I did not play spring rugby at the Naval Academy because I was always injured somehow, whether it was a concussion, it was uh, ankle sprains. Um, I just did not want to risk getting injured because every season I was somehow injured and I just tape it up and go and suck it up. But I wanted to be at a hundred percent when I went to selection. So you gotta, gotta be smart on that. But yeah, I mean, I think that's great. Getting, getting hit in the face. It's a great way to build confidence, mental toughness, but be smart about it. Final question for those split between enlisting or trying to commission. What advice do you have for them? For those officers you've trained, how satisfied are they compared to enlisted counterparts? Both love their jobs. Um, 
I have guys that, um, obviously I train at Naval Academy. They're all going to be officers. They know their job going in will be a little different than the enlisted guys. Um, but they are going there to be leaders, um, and understanding bigger picture than just focusing on a particular job or a, a particular skill. You got to think of the big picture. So it's just a different position on the, on the football team. You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, um, you know, linemen and quarterbacks are the same, right? The quarterback may be a rookie quarterback and he's got all these veterans all around him, you know, but who's responsible of calling the play and getting the ball down the field. It's that quarterback. So kind of think of the officer as the, uh, the rookie quarterback coming in, you know, he's not going to be in charge, you know, immediately. It's probably going to be about four or five years before he's in charge of anybody. So he's got some years to be a backup quarterback, so to speak, play a little bit, but not be exactly in charge. And then eventually he'll be in charge and be the starting quarterback, you know, with some knowledge under his belt and understanding of how the system works. So that's, that's my best analogy I can give you there. It's just different jobs, right? Um, yes, the guys that have college degrees and decide to enlist um, enjoy their job while they're young. Um, but then many of them, by the time they're 29, 30 years old, um, decide to go to OCS and become officers in that job. You know, so that's a great way to learn a profession as an enlisted guy and then later coming in as a Mustang you know, five, six, 10 years later, even, and uh, becoming an officer. It, it, it extends your operational career for sure. If you do that, because you can spend several years being an operator on the enlisted side, learning some really cool skills, being part of an elite team. And then, you know, later on, you can come back and do the junior officer process be the assistant officer in charge and be then be the officer in charge then move on to maybe squadron commander things like that so but you have a lot of experience and no one's going to bs you because you've kind of been there done that too so um i i like all routes be honest with you i've seen good officers that came from the came from the academy and rotc and i've seen bad ones i've seen good officers that came from the enlisted route and I've seen bad ones. You know, there's no great way to produce them. It really comes down to how quickly you can learn the skill of being a SEAL officer or SEAL enlisted for that matter and applying your tools of the trade to your job. All right. Um, I do have one more CSS video. If I missed your questions, um, just send them to me again. Um, I see, I don't see many questions, but I see more. Um, yeah, you can send me a CSS anytime and I will answer them um, personally, but then I may share them also on the uh, one of the shows or maybe on Instagram or TikTok. Um, if you don't mind doing that. Um, let me see here. Let me get this started. This is kind of a hard one to see at first, but it's not too bad. You share the screen. This is the last thing I'm going to do because we're almost sitting at an hour. So let's go for a solid hour. So kick off the wall. That's pretty good. Double arm pull. You notice he stayed underwater the whole time. One Mississippi, two Mississippi pull. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's got a little weird kick. Kind of comes out there, but it's moving. I mean, this isn't bad. It's going to be pretty fast now that I think about it, but there's a lot of strokes to it. So I think he could probably lengthen his glide just a little bit. Let's see. One Mississippi, two Mississippi pull. Yeah. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. So he's shortening his glide. So he's doing too many strokes per length, but it's pretty good. Just a little more tiring than it needs to be. You can actually get another couple of yards out of that glide if you give it a couple seconds because you're going faster than a yard per second here. I mean, it looks like you're at 47, 48 seconds. So if you're able to hold this for nine more laps, you're going to get yourself about an eight flat. 
looks like you're popping up just a little bit. I mean, your head's still in the water, but it just looks like you're kind of swimming like, like this a little bit versus turning to breathe and being a little more uh, stable in this line versus like that. Not bad. He's coming up at that red marker. It's a good place to come up. If you hold that glide for another, like just hold it right there for just another second, you're you're getting some pretty good distance on this glide before you decide to pull. You could probably get a little bit longer out of it. So there you go. So you guys are welcome. Uh, thanks for sticking around uh, for asking questions. Yes, you can get college degree while in the teams. It's just hard to do it while you're an active duty team guy. Um, you may need a shore duty, maybe buds. A lot of guys get their college done at buds um, while they're buds instructors. Um, all right. So I'm going to go on this one. Um, let me see. I do have a gift for you guys for sticking around um, today and tomorrow. If you go to stewsmithfitness.com and use the thanks to five code, Thanks to five, that'll save you 25% off programs, off books and ebooks. So um, give it a shot. Um, if you want to see some really good um, critiques that you don't have to hunt for them all over YouTube, just go to my TikTok page, Stu Smith50. And all I do on TikTok is talk about the CSS and its critique. Um, so you can go through, I think I have almost a hundred videos on there now of me just critiquing submitted um, CSS swims. So check it out. You might get something out of it. Um, and uh, until next time, um, once again, go to stewsmithfitness.com. Check out the latest articles. And if you have questions, send them. Sorry if I didn't get to them. If I missed yours, just keep keep sending them my way. Happy to help you. We'll see you later. Happy Thanksgiving.